Well, this is it. This is the final episode in the current run of How Are You Adapting? Over the past 10 weeks, we've heard case studies, best practices, and practical advice from leaders of organizations both large and small throughout Canada. We learned about the power of being authentic when pivoting online from Gilad of Jayu in episode one. Katie from Unity Charity made us think differently about accessibility in episode four. Barry from the National Ballet of Canada gave us a blueprint on being resilient. Kelly from Workman Arts gave us a glimpse into how they are keeping their community engaged. And Eric showed us how Ghost River Theatre is creating brand new experiences rather than just broadcasting a stage show online. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you haven't seen any of the previous episodes, visit our blog at www.businessandarts.org forward slash blog. All of the adapting episodes are there, along with other wonderful video resources we've been adding on a weekly basis. This week, we end the series with Jen Shaw from Hot Talks. If you ever wanted advice and examples on how to emerge from this crisis in plain language, this is the episode for you. Jen talks about everything from pivoting the Hot Dogs Festival to a digital offering. She chats about how they dealt with the vendors, the copyrights, the funders, and the measures Hot Dogs took from SARS to prepare themselves for COVID-19 and whatever the future holds. I am the Director of Sponsorship Marketing at Hot Docs, and I oversee all aspects of corporate partnerships, um, and we leverage a range of our festival assets and our cinema assets to create unique brand and content opportunities um, that resonate with our audiences. We try really hard to connect um, brands and companies um, with our audiences and knowing what they like and they don't like, and so we try to make sure that um, uh, both at the festival and the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema, um, that everything is pretty organic and that our partnerships really reflect the core values of hot dogs and our audiences um, and that ultimately helps our partners. Brilliant. Welcome, Jen. A couple weeks ago, I spoke with Barry Houston from the National Ballet of Canada and one of his lessons was document everything. Document absolutely everything so you'll have a playbook for when the next pandemic hits. Your team at Hot Dogs built a playbook from the lessons learned during the SARS outbreak, what, 17 years ago? So how helpful was that during this pandemic? It was incredibly helpful. And I think um, Hot Docs has a, a lot of, uh, I call us lifers. There's a lot of people that have been with the organization for, um, for many, many years. This is my 18th festival. Um, and I think the reason being is that we started off very small and you know we've grown pretty exponentially from you know, 5,000 audience members when I started with Hot Docs up to you know, 230,000 as of last year's festival. So, um, we're always doing new things and trying new things, uh, and that's, that seems to keep people um, at the organization over time. So we do have a really strong institutional knowledge. Um, so our executive director um, and our operations manager and myself um, and our communications director were all on the Hot Talks team uh, back when SARS hit. Um, and when that happened, um, you know, we, we didn't know what to do. We were a much smaller organization. Um, we, we really, we were paralyzed. Um, although we, quick, we quickly realized that um, the industry side of our event was definitely going to be impacted. We realized that pretty quickly because um, SARS really restricted travel and there were a lot of organizations that put travel bans in place. So, um, you know, back in 2003, I think it was, um, the internet was not what it is now. Um, and so for us to figure out how to do an industry conference in any setting other than a live event setting was very overwhelming. Um, but I, I will say that we did it. So we were able to have local people show up to our live event um, and through the the power of the telephone and Skype <laughs> and a little bit of internet, we actually were able to patch in buyers from around the world. So we do um, a pitch forum every year that is basically the dragon's den of uh, documentary film financing. Um, uh, people pitch their projects and we basically shop those projects around the world. So uh, during SARS, we were still able to do that by uh, having the pitches happen and have the buyers um, and the financiers on the phone listening to the pitches. So we still were able to do the business that needed to get done. Um, we had to scale way back on our industry conferences and our sessions. Um, and so when we heard in late February, early March, uh, that COVID was not getting any better, um, uh, to, you know, our executive director, to his, his uh, esteem, um, he quickly jumped into action. He made sure that 
all of the department heads uh, had connected with staff to see if we could all work from home. Did we have the equipment? Did people have reliable internet? Um, and so when the work from home order came down, uh, we were we were prepared. Um, you know, we knew that that we could get everybody at home. We knew that everybody could reach the servers. Uh, we got Zoom, I think, on the second day of work from home because we realized we needed to have some sort of functionality to be able to communicate with each other. Um, and I, I will say, you know, there were some some blips along uh, the road with that, but I have to say that it, it was pretty seamless um, and the staff transitioned um, pretty quickly to working from home. Um, we have a platform at Hot Docs that we developed a couple of years ago called the Doc Shop, uh, and that is a, a a market platform that hosts um, films from the festival on a year-round basis so that uh, different festivals and networks and buyers can can watch that content throughout the year and it's really a service for filmmakers to be able to have their work available for people who might want to buy it or program it um, and we worked with a, a company called Cinesend they're a Toronto-based tech company um, and so we had this platform developed uh, and we our, our director of industry was pretty confident that we could probably host our industry conference and market using Zoom uh, and using the platform. Um, and in a really short amount of time, like three weeks, we were able to um, put the entire industry conference online during the original dates of the Hot Dogs Festival. So it was all, all staff on deck. Uh, some of my team became Zoom camera operators. Um, one of my, my uh, colleague Lawrence has actually become like a core part of the tech team doing all of this live stuff because he's just got a real aptitude for it. And he's also got the, the customer service sponsorship background. So he's really able to make people feel comfortable and he's able to host um, some of these industry events that we're doing and now live events for the festival. So. It's been really cool to see everybody on the staff just kind of jump in and take on new roles and do different things. Um, but the fact that we were able to bring the industry conference online as quickly as we did um, was incredibly helpful. We were able to, um, anybody who had bought a pass uh, to the industry conference, uh, you know, we did a reduced fee because it wasn't a live event, but we were able to get about 1,500 people taking part in the online um, conference. Uh, we had all of the content up until May the 30th, so um, everything was pre-recorded and people could kind of at their leisure log in and check out what was happening. Um, but during the actual week of the industry conference, we were hosting uh, live Zoom networking events. Um, and we didn't know if it was going to work. We didn't know how that connection would happen, um, you know, not in person, um, but it worked and people were really grateful to have the opportunity to connect. Um, and you know, we had different staff hosting, we had some different people from the industry host, uh, and we were able to kind of go around the Zoom room. We limited it to 25 people per hangout. Um, and it was great, it was great to see, you know, people who had films on the festival, filmmakers were able to talk about their film and we were able to direct people to that work. Um, newcomers uh, to the industry could ask questions and we had, you know, some pretty big names on these hangouts. So, um, it wasn't live, but it was the next best thing. Uh, and I think people were really grateful to have those connecting points um, during, the, during the industry conference. Uh, and we're currently running our live uh, public facing film festival now. Um, but I think you're gonna ask me some questions about that uh, later on. So I won't go too much into that, but uh, all of that is to say that um, SARS really did impact our industry conference and we were really prepared for that. Um, it did not affect our public screenings at all. Um, uh, and that was a really interesting thing. When this whole thing hit, I think we all thought that our public screenings would be protected and we wouldn't really have to worry about that. Um, and then as soon as it became obvious, you know, we, we run a cinema in downtown Toronto um, and we closed it a couple of days before the city mandated closures just because we could tell that this was not a, a good thing for our staff and not a, a, a good environment for audiences. So. I think as soon as that happened, the realization that public screenings were going to be impacted um, hit us pretty hard. And that's when the team really had to figure out a whole bunch of logistical things um, to figure out how to make a public festival happen. I would also like to just touch on one of the other lessons that we learned from SARS. Uh, I didn't mention this originally, but Hot Docs was really lucky in that, um, I would say the biggest lesson that we learned from SARS was that when you run a live event, uh, anything can happen and you don't have control over everything in the world. So 
whether it's a global pandemic or whether it's an economic recession, um, there are certain things that are outside of our control. Uh, and the only thing that you can do is plan as best as you can um, for those worst case scenarios. Uh, so after SARS hit um, and everything got back to normal, the first thing our executive director did was develop, develop a plan um, for hot dogs to start to build an accumulated surplus. Um, we've always been really fiscally um, lean and mean. Uh, we always live within our means. Um, we never spend more than we have. We make decisions sometimes fairly late based on what the finances are saying so that we're not um, in an economic, you know, bad place um, with the budget. Uh, and so over the years since SARS, every year we put a little bit away every single year into an accumulated surplus account. Um, and the rate, this, we call it the rainy day fund. And it's always been there in case something happens where something happens catastrophic to the organization and we need to wind down. We've got the funds to do that. Uh, or a global pandemic hits and, you know, we don't know how many um, sponsors and partners we're going to be able to retain and are we going to be able to make payroll. Um, so when, when COVID hit, the one thing that we weren't panicked about was finances. I mean, obviously that's a going concern, but knowing that we had the rainy day fund allowed um, the senior management team to make decisions based on um, having that as a backup and that as a bit of a cushion. Uh, and I think for any organization, big or small, that's something that after this, I think everybody should really consider uh, how they can how they can build up that accumulated surplus so that they've got that little bit of a financial cushion um, for when the unexpected happens. That is such, such great advice. And kudos to the team for putting these plans into place. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hot Talks is made up essentially of the industry conference, yep. the public facing festival and the yes. cinema, correct? Yes. So those three initiatives and the lessons learned from SARS, your team had to transition to working from home very, very quickly, as yep. you mentioned. Can you tell me a little bit about that shift in work-life balance and trying to maintain those three individual properties under one umbrella? It was really interesting. So working from home is not something that uh, I have ever experienced. I've always worked from an office. Uh, I've always kind of been nine to five, 9.30 to 5.30. Um, I have my workspace in the office. I don't even have an office at home. My husband's a musician, so our, our spare bedroom is his drum room. Um, and so uh, my, my little laptop wouldn't fit in there. So for the first couple of weeks, I tried to you know sit on the couch with three dogs on top of me and doing Zoom and trying to keep my notes. And I, I really quickly realized that was not gonna work. I really needed a setup similar to my, my office setup. So uh, I snuck into the office and I got my laptop holder and I brought my whiteboard home and <laughs> took a picture of my office so that I could re like make my dining room kind of a similar setup. Um, and so, yeah, I really realized that working from home is almost exactly the same as working from the office. You need the organization, you need the tools that, that work for you. Um, and especially when you're not able to just drop by somebody else's office to have a quick conversation. Um, Hot Docs also works on a third party event called the World Congress of Science and Factual Producers. So during this time of, of transitioning with the industry conference, the cinema and the festival, we're also looking at an event that we're producing in December that was supposed to be in Strasbourg. Um, so that's another line of business that I had to keep track of and sitting on a couch with no organization was gonna be my demise. <laughs> it was not gonna work. Um, so I think, you know, we, we figured out schedules for our senior management team. We um, initially, we were doing Zoom connections every morning at nine o'clock for the first couple of weeks while we were, figuring out what we were going to do and what it was going to look like. Um, we're down to twice a week now um, because things are kind of rolling and in motion and everybody sets up their own calls um, as needed with other staff. Uh, my team meets uh, three times a week on Zoom just to make sure that everybody knows what they're working on and uh, knows what their priorities are. And also it's just really nice to have a, a check-in point. Um, I think it is very isolated working from home, especially people who, you know, I have a, a partner, but a lot of my team uh, are single. Um, and so just working and living in the same space and not having a lot of connection points. Um, it's been, you know, having Zoom and being able to, to have our work check-ins, but then also having our, 
you know, director of culture and community doing hangouts at lunch and like we had an opening night party on Zoom uh, when the festival opened and everybody kind of had a drink and they did like an Oscar ceremony. And so keeping that connection with all of our team members because we are a fairly large organization. So um, making sure that each team and kind of the management team all have their connect connecting points, uh, but making sure that the communication stays as open as it was in the office. Um, because we really are just as busy, if not busier, um, now with all of these new things happening. Such brilliant foresight. So a couple of weeks ago, the Hot Dog Festival was launched digitally. Can you tell me a little bit about that process and adapting it from a physical festival to one that is digital and online? Our original goal when all of this hit was um, we had messaged that we were postponing the festival. So for us, um, our, our every intention for us was to have a live event where filmmakers could, could show their work to live audiences, feel that energy, have the Q&A, uh, and really have the festival experience that Hot Docs has become known for. Filmmakers love to screen their work at Hot Docs because of how amazing Toronto audiences are. Um, and so for us, when we realized we had to postpone the festival, uh, and then we realized it was probably going to be months and months and months before we'd actually be able to have people in our cinema and other cinemas again. Um, you know, for us, it was heartbreaking because, you know, our, our entire team works all year long for the festival. But more importantly, the filmmakers work for years on these films that are so important and telling such important stories and heartbreaking for us to not be able to give them that platform to show the important work that they're making. So. Um, you know, there became a certain point where we thought, you know, if it's September, that's probably going to be too late. Like, it's not going to be worth our time if, we, if we're even able to do a live event, because that's when we start the next cycle for Hot Docs 2021. Um, we start doing, you know, right after TIFF, we start with our submissions process, and we start the whole cycle again for the next year's festival. So when it became obvious that social distancing was gonna be a thing for quite some time, uh, we started to think about how we might be able to um, transition to a digital festival. Uh, and there were a lot of hurdles um, to that, um, not the least of which uh, distributors are not super keen to show new work digitally. It's not something that is uh, done. Um, or <laughs> up until maybe a month ago, it wasn't done. But I think the distributors and filmmakers are now even thinking like, we actually want people to see our film. We don't necessarily want to shelve it for another year, or year and a half. So uh, our director of programming started doing some digging to find out uh, who in North America and Europe had done a digital festival and what were their best practices? What were their learnings? Um, there were a couple of festivals in the States that had done uh, digital festivals and interestingly they use Cinescend, which is the company that we work with, they're a Toronto based company, but, but very well known for their technology. Um, and so we had that platform in place and we thought, okay, cool, like we can, we can potentially work with Cinescend to figure out how to do this stuff in a digital setting. And we started out with the cinema. So we did a, a bit of a trial with the cinema. Uh, we got some distributors to agree to um, let us stream first run work um, to our audience members. We didn't know if audience members would pay for new content because there's a million platforms that they can see everything on. Uh, it turns out people get sick of Netflix and Crave <laughs> and there is an end to those endless uh, platforms of content. Uh, and so we, we learned that there was a really big appetite for new film. Um, and so that was our, our litmus test, was launching a couple of films uh, at our new digital cinema. Um, Alan Black, who's our managing director of the cinema, likes to say that we recreated Netflix in two weeks, which is true. <laughs> um, so the, the team at Cinescend really knew how to make all of the back end work and how to make all of that technology magic happen. Uh, Alan and his team had to figure out how to make our online ticketing system talk to our database and how to make both of those things talk to the Cinescend back end. Um, and I don't know anything about that. I was not involved at all because if I was, it would not be working right now. <laughs> um, and then our programming team really did the work of calling the filmmakers and calling the distributors. Uh, we put together a deck based on the best practices of a couple of the other festivals that we had consulted with. So figuring out the security of the film online, geo-blocking so that we wouldn't be taking all of the rights, like we wouldn't take global rights, we would take Ontario rights, so that that made it a little bit more interesting um, for filmmakers and distributors. They're not, you know, giving away the entire film uh, for Toronto audiences, it's just going to be Ontario, and that still means that they can sell their global rights to other platforms for 
much more money than a not-for-profit could offer. Um, so Shane and his team did a great job of, of connecting with filmmakers and distributors and the festival is on right now. We launched last Thursday and uh, we're super proud of the fact that we have 140 brand new documentaries that are streaming now for audiences. Uh, we've got thousands of people who have uh, bought tickets and who have kept their, their passes um, to you know their five pack streaming vouchers. We've got people who buy all you can eat streaming passes and uh, it's been working out. Um, the tech has been our, our biggest thing was, oh my God, is this all going to work when we go live? Um, there've been a couple of little hiccups uh, here and there, but all in all, very, very smooth. And I think we're all kind of a little bit shell-shocked that it's happening and it's working. And we have a Roku app and an Apple TV app. And it's like, really? That's how, we're a little not-for-profit. How is, why do I have hot dogs beside Crave on my Roku? This is so cool. So it's working and uh, we're definitely gonna continue with the digital cinema um, uh, as we move forward until we're allowed to open our cinema again, because we're not really sure when that's gonna happen. You're charging for the festival and so many arts organizations are apprehensive to put a price tag on what they're offering during this time. What were some concerns and anxieties about charging for this festival? For us, we pay the filmmakers for their work. So uh, we couldn't afford to do it for free. They deserve to be paid for their film. Um, and audiences, quite frankly, uh, need to pay for new content. Um, and so uh, we, we came up with a price point that we thought would work. Uh, we tested it out at the cinema. Uh, and, and the feedback we got was that it was affordable and, and workable. Um, and you know what, people, I think people are happy, A, to support an arts organization that they know and love. We're very lucky that we have such a dedicated audience. And I think we've, uh, as a team, been overwhelmed by the support that we've received from donors. We've gotten, you know, people who are purchasing Founder Circle memberships. We've got people who are making donations alongside of their ticket purchase so that they can support the festival so that we can continue the work that we do. And that means that the filmmakers can continue doing the work that they do. So for us, we knew we had to charge something. We had to kind of figure out what that, that amount was. Um, I will say that I listen to CBC radio all day long. <laughs> and um, I've heard some really cool and interesting uh, interviews um, on Q. And uh, they, they talked to a lot of musical artists who, when the pandemic started, they were doing free musical concerts on Instagram. And uh, a couple of artists were saying, you know, they would, they would start their concert on Instagram and they would start out with like a thousand people. And then after three minutes, it would drop and drop and drop and drop. And so, um, you know, the connection wasn't really there. And so, you know, a few weeks into the pandemic, some of these artists started to do Zoom concerts and they would charge a minimum fee. It would be pay what you can. Um, and they found that people actually paying money for something meant that they would stick around for a whole hour and watch the concert. So I think just like in regular life, when you're paying something, you see value in that and uh, your commitment to it is a little bit more than if, if things are just being offered for free. And at the beginning, I think everybody was offering up things for free because everyone wanted, you know, audiences to feel connected and to, to give them something to take their mind off of what's happening in the world. But I think as we move along, we're really seeing that if, you know, people are willing to pay what they can um, for new content and for content and arts content that is interesting to them. Um, so I think that uh, people shouldn't to be really conscientious of what that price point is. Uh, don't be afraid to survey your audiences and find out what, it, what that price point would work for them. Um, you don't want to charge too little because you don't want to lose money, but you also don't want to charge too much just because people are also financially strapped right now. Okay, so I think the average person or consumer has no idea what geolocking is. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is and why the festival is only open to people physically in Ontario? If you ever try to go to an American um, network website to watch highlights from your favorite American show, if you have one, and it says, sorry, these rights aren't available in your country, um, that's geoblocking. Uh, Netflix also has geoblocking. Um, if you've ever tried to log into the American side of Netflix, um, it's geoblocked so that if you're in Canada, uh, your computer and your technology uh, says where you are in the world. Um, so for us, uh, geoblocking to Ontario, um, there were a couple of reasons that we did that. Um, the first reason was that um, by not taking global rights to a film, we found that distributors and filmmakers were a lot 
um, more open to considering um, screening with hot dogs. Um, generally, our audiences are Toronto or Ontario based audiences. We do get some people who fly in from other countries just for the festival or from other provinces, but generally our core audience is based here in Ontario. So for us to pitch to a filmmaker that essentially it would be the same audiences who would come to the festival who would be seeing these films, uh, that was an easier pitch to them. The other thing that we did is that we negotiated the number of streams. So um, at the festival, every film would get three screenings. Um, and so we would ballpark it at say, uh, every film had 700 tickets um, over three screenings, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. So by working with the distributors, rights holders, um, and by saying, you know, we're gonna limit it to X amount of streams within Ontario, that was our way of being able to say to them, this is recreating an online version of what would have happened in person anyway. So these are the same people that would be seeing the film had we been able to do a live festival. Um, and I think uh, a lot of distributors wanted to maybe dip their toe in the water to see how it would work streaming new content because uh, most of them don't like to do that. Um, and it's not something that's really been done before until the pandemic hit. Um, and, and by keeping it kind of localized, those people are still able to go to Netflix to say, yeah, my film streamed in Ontario, but the rest of the world has never seen it. So, you know, if it's getting a lot of buzz at Hot Docs and it got a lot of buzz at South by Southwest, um, uh, you know, a platform like Netflix or Crave could still say like, okay, great, there's still a big audience available for this out in the world. It's only streamed here in Ontario. And that's, you know, that's also why the film started to get a little bit of buzz. So festivals are very much about, um, you know, getting word of mouth, getting press, getting some attention to your film. And so we were able to do that for filmmakers in a digital setting by, by keeping it tight and keeping it kind of like a digital footprint of what it would have been um, at the live festival. Yeah, I think for the average person, when they hop on YouTube and search for a clip of um, like SNL, yeah. and you see it's not available outside the US, and you say, why is it this way? But it's about protecting the intellectual property. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, the interesting thing for our digital cinema is that we've been figuring out ways to create original content. So um, we have a series that takes place at the cinema called The Curious, Curious Minds Mornings. And so those are kind of later life learning um, uh, courses that we offer on you know, cinema in Toronto or Italian food or the history of the Roman Empire. Um, and we'll bring in a lecturer who talks about this subject over the course of six weeks. Um, and we've been selling those out and it's been fantastic um, to see our audiences looking for, uh, you know, more curious content outside of just docs. So we decided to, to try and pilot that in an online setting. Um, and, and because we own that content, we've actually been able to open it up across Canada. Um, and so Hollywood Suite, the broadcaster, um, is our partner on that, and they worked with us to create a 30-second uh, commercial for Curious Minds. And they've been, um, up until a couple of days ago, they've been in a free preview window during the pandemic so that, you know, audiences will have a chance to kind of see what Hollywood Suite is all about. And by airing that trailer, um, we've been able to get people uh, registering for our courses, our Curious Minds courses from across the country and not just in Toronto. So for us, that was a really interesting experiment because now we know if we, you know, we know there's an appetite for this interesting content that doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, and now we know that people all over the country are interested in, in participating. So for us, um, doing more of that kind of content that we own is something that we're looking at doing at the cinema. Um, and then we don't need to have geo-blocking in place because we're the rights owners for that. Tell me a little bit about the digital pre-shows. What are they? And are they being used for the festival right now? Digital pre-shows, uh, they're at Cineplex, they're at most festivals. Basically, when you walk into the theater a half hour before the film starts, it's just the pre-roll that's screening. So you'll see uh, internal messaging, you'll see partnership advertising, you'll see, um, you know, a whole range of content that exists within our digital pre-shows. And for us, that's a really lucrative asset for our sponsors. Um, it's a great way to get content um, in front of audiences when they're sitting in a, you know, kind of a, a passive setting um, and they're consuming what's on the screen. And again, it's, it's really targeted to their interests and um, the demographic that attends the festival. So for us, that was a big piece of the puzzle that we had to figure out um, for the digital um, festival, uh, knowing that we didn't have a half hour, like people are not going to sit through a half hour pre-show in their living room. They'll just, 
either not watch the film or fast forward through it. Um, but we definitely had some partners, like all of our key partners, CBC Docs and Rogers and uh, Crave and uh, Scotia Wealth Management, um, you know, all of those folks, uh, they're very big and important partners and they, they all, you know, get a, a trailer of some sort before the films in the festival. So we were able to work with, uh, with CineSend and figure out, based on our different screening programs, how we could still give that profile to those different sponsors. Um, and we were able to do it in a way that we think people understand that our partners are the, the reason why we're still able to exist and we're still able to put this festival on. Um, but we kept it to a reasonable amount. So we have no more than three 30 second trailers before a film. Uh, and then we also have one of our programmers introduce the film. So even if you're sitting in your living room, the other night my executive director was in my living room introducing a film that I was watching. Um, and just, you know, I work at the festival, but I'm also a big fan and I was a fan before I worked for the festival. So to hear him thank our partners and our supporters and our audiences and our volunteers, and then to sit through a couple of trailers knowing that those are the folks that have helped this organization succeed, um, I, I thought that was a really reasonable way to approach our pre-shows. Um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, it's, it's a huge benefit to our partners. So being able to continue with that was something that was really important to us. Speaking of that partnership, how has your relationship with the funders and sponsors changed due to the pandemic and the push to go digital? It's interesting. I think we've been incredibly lucky that, that the majority of our partners, um, so the majority of our corporate partners, our government partners, our foundation partners, our founder circle, um, you know, private donors, um, they're all big fans and supporters of the work that we do. Uh, and so for us, you know, we had to have some hard conversations when this whole thing happened to say, you know, we're not going to be able to do a live festival. Um, we don't know when we're able, going to be able to reschedule that. And we, we really hope you'll stick with us. Um, we're working on some, some creative ideas, um, you know, and also hearing what they needed and wanted. So, you know, uh, I think a cool example is CBC Docs. Um, they're our signature partner of the festival. They usually get a ton of branding and a ton of activation opportunities in the live event setting. And we weren't gonna be able to do that. Um, so we asked them, what's important for you right now? How can we rebuild this partnership, um, continue to work together? And, you know, how do we help reinforce some of the things that you're needing at this moment in time? And uh, it turns out that was a really good question to ask because CBC uh, were dealing with the fact that there was not going to be any hockey or sports, there was not going to be any Olympics, um, and so they had a lot of spaces to fill in their calendar. Um, and it turns out they had uh, several films that they owned the rights to that were going to be doing a world premiere um, at the festival. So we came up with the idea of uh, we came up really quickly with what we called hot dogs at home. So when the pandemic first hit, we started putting out curated lists of where people could find past hot dogs films on different platforms. And that was really popular with our, our audiences because they were looking for content. We've curated it for them and told them where to go to get it. So the hot dogs at home brand became something that um, that is still we're still working with it now. So we said to CBC that they needed to air these films pretty quickly. Um, and because they own the rights, they didn't need our permission to put those films up on their own network. Um, but what they did was uh, asked if they could leverage the Hot Docs brand and do Hot Docs at Home world premieres of these um, doc channel and doc, uh, document, documentary channel and CBC Docs titles. And so we did a co-brand where every Thursday night, um, Hot Docs at Home on CBC would, would screen a brand new film. Um, and it would air on CBC at eight o'clock, Doc Channel at nine o'clock, and then it would live on a Hot Docs folder on CBC Gem. So for us, that's great because people across the country are now hearing about Hot Docs and, and learning more about who we are and what we do. Um, and then our programmer, our director of programming, Shane Smith, would then do a post-screening Q&A um, with the subjects and with the filmmakers, exactly like we do at the festival. And uh, those Q&As would live on CBC Gem and also on the Hot Docs website. So we were able to lend the Hot Docs Festival brand to these films that got into Hot Docs that were CBC titles. And we created a whole new partnership um, based on some of their needs um, and using films that had already been curated into our festival. Um, so I think that's a really great example of just listening to our partners and what they need and figuring out how can we jump in and be a part of um, filling that need. 
Um, another example is Scotia Wealth Management. They're a huge partner of the festival. They sponsor our Big Ideas series. Um, and when this hit, uh, you know, they're huge supporters of the arts and they, without hesitation, said, we are with you, we will continue supporting you. Um, and they said, you know, here's some of the things that we're dealing with right now. You know, we've got thousands of frontline employees who are dealing with people and their finances uh, in a really, you know, a time of upheaval and it's got to be really stressful for them. We'd love to be able to offer them access to hot dogs at no cost. Um, and we said, absolutely, you know, they, they get access to the festival. So um, we were able to work with them so that they could create an offer to their frontline staff to be able to watch some films at home. Um, we programmed a custom uh, Big Ideas Hot Docs at Home from past titles that had been in the series. Um, and that went out to, to all of their frontline staff. Um, and then for their clients who would normally get to attend the Big Ideas series, uh, we gave them the same level of access. So they still got access to our Big Ideas films. Uh, and then for the, um, the festival this week, we're doing a series of live events based around those Big Ideas titles. So um, those clients are still getting that access and albeit at home and they don't have a fancy cocktail to go to along with it. Um, we've been able to you know, create opportunities that are beneficial still to, to that partner um, and we'll continue to do that um, with the digital cinema. We'll figure out different ways and different offerings that we can um, give to them so that we're helping them. Uh, and at the same time, they're continuing to support us. Brilliant. So what advice would you give to arts organizations that are struggling to deal with their funders and sponsors? At Hot Docs, we're always, we're always honest. And I think honesty is the best policy. I think uh, a lot of organizations are trying to be stoic and trying to kind of candy coat a situation that really cannot be candy coated. Um, and for us, we were just straight up with our, with our partners, you know, we just said, you know, if, if we lose your funding, we don't know if we're going to exist in six months. And that's, that's the reality of it. And I think, when I think about saying that out loud, you know, people look at Hot Docs as this big organization, um, you know, that has grown so significantly. And, you know, if our partners don't stick with us, we're not going to exist. So if a smaller organization's partners don't stick with them, you know, they're not going to exist either. And so um, I think being really honest with partners about that reality, I mean, I think everyone knows the not-for-profit art sector is, you know, tenuous at best. Funding is never guaranteed and it's always a fight to, to you know, get the, the funds that you need to, to put on the performances or the films or the, you know, the gallery showings or whatever it is that you do. Um, I think it's important to be honest with your audiences as well. And I think uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to, you know, do a fundraiser or do a, a push um, around, you know, a certain campaign to really help support the work that you do. Um, uh, and I think, I think it's really important to remember that people in these times are craving creativity and art. And that's, you know, it's, it's part of who we are as humans to want to express ourselves through cr the creative industries. Um, and I think now more than ever, a, a lot of people are really realizing how much that means to them. So I think it's a time, I mean, I try to stay positive in times like this, even though it is really challenging, but I think using the smart people in your organization to come up with unique ways to engage your audiences, to, ke to keep them supporting you and to keep your partners supporting you, um, people will appreciate the honesty and they'll appreciate the fact that, you know what, if they don't support you, you might not exist. And then, you know, what does the world look like without that? The cinema, that's the physical face of hot dogs. How is that experience evolving? Honestly, I drive by the cinema all the time. I live really close to it. And it's so sad to see this beautiful, you know, stately building with nobody in it enjoying it. Um, and it's heartbreaking because we have no idea when that's going to happen again. And even when we're allowed back in, we don't know if we're going to have to have, you know, glass walls up between every five seats. Like we just, we're not sure how it's going to look. So I think for now we're really focusing on the digital cinema um, and, and really working with uh, rights holders and filmmakers and figuring out um, how we can work with them to get um, first run content uh, up in that digital cinema. Um, our team has done a great job of educating our audiences about how to stream. Uh, you have to stream films from the Hot Docs website. Um, that's part of how the system is built. Uh, and for people who aren't super tech savvy, it can be a little bit confusing if they want to watch it on their TV and they don't have Roku or Apple TV. Um, screen mirroring is not something most people do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, and so, you know, a lot of our cinema staff have actually had to transition into being tech customer service people, and that's not their background. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if we're offering a digital offering, we have to have the customer support on the back end to make it easy for audiences, as otherwise they're not going to come back. Um, so I think we're really looking at ways to keep all of this really audience friendly, to keep it fresh, to keep the content um, new and engaging. Uh, we're currently looking at our podcast festival that's uh, a live event that's super popular at the cinema uh, and figuring out how do we do that in an online um, setting. Um, and then just being super creative and figuring out different things and different partners we can work with to bring um, new ideas and, and new programs to the digital cinema. Um, we're lucky that we have that platform and that offering. And so, um, you know, most people are connected to the internet and can access that. So if we can keep that content fresh and interesting, um, and if we continue to listen to our audiences and you know, listen to what they want, um, we'll be able to respond to that and hopefully people will continue to stick with us until they can get back into the cinema. I love what you said just now. If you're going to be offering digital experiences, you're going to have to be prepared to offer tech support. Totally. You can't overestimate what your audience already knows. Well, and here's a fun fact. My entire sponsorship team are also hot dogs ticketing agents. <laughs> We've got thousands and thousands of, you know, uh, digital promotional codes that go out to our partners. Um, and, you know, our ticketing staff are busy dealing with thousands and thousands of public audience members. So, um, you know, we had to get everybody set up. We did training on our agile ticketing system. Um, and I have to tell you, it's really hilarious. I, I'll get an email at nine o'clock at night from a partner who, you know, has five films and they need an account set up. I get so excited setting up the account and putting their films into it and sending them their note, telling them that this is on its way. It's just so different from what I generally do. So I think one of the cool things of this pivot, as the kids are saying, is that we've all had to pick up new skills and, you know, customer service is really at the heart of what sponsorship is um, and really being able to be the person who's putting the films into somebody's account and, you know, waiting to hear how they enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's a really cool experience. And I think uh, it's, it's been fun for all of us to jump in and just kind of do whatever needs to be done to make this thing happen. Yes. And it's also that one-on-one -on -one connection because if you're doing a million things, the connection is still key. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And finally, Jen, where can we find out more about Hot Docs? This is your opportunity to plug anything and everything. Cool. Yeah, so hotdocs.ca um, is where you will find the, uh, the industry portal. You'll find the Hot Docs Cinema. Uh, and you'll also find the 2020 Hot Docs Festival that is running now. Uh, most of our films are going to be streaming until June the 24th. A few films will come off at the end of this week, but the vast majority will be on until the end of the month. So really encourage people to come and check that out. Um, we've got a free film called Hockey 24 that we worked with Scotia um, Hockey and um, the NHL on, and that's streaming for free at hotdogs.ca. So if you've got any hockey fans in your life, it's a really cool day in the life uh, of Canadians and what hockey means to them. It's a really fun uh, film. Um, and then all of our first run um, cinema content can be found there as well. Uh, we're on Facebook, uh, Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Festival. We're on Instagram at Hot Docs, um, and we're on Twitter at Hot Docs as well. So you can check us out in all of those places. Um, and I will also say that I'm a very proud Arts Fest mentor. Um, and so you can find me on the um, Mentor City platform. Um, and if you're looking for a mentor to help you through some of these times, there's myself, my colleague Adam Kirkham is also an Arts Fest mentor. Uh, and there's tons of other fantastic mentors on there as well. So always encourage people um, who are part of the Arts Fest program in particular. Uh, don't be shy about reaching out to your mentors. Thank you so much for that Arts Fest shout out. Yeah, we've been doing so many different webinars and the Arts Fest team, since this all started, have been unstoppable. Oh yeah, totally. And it's, it's such a great resource to have for people because they're uncertain times and nobody necessarily has the answers. So really the best we can do is continue to be a community and continue to share what's working and what's not working so well. And, um, you know, uh, I have to say, I know a lot of the smaller arts organizations are lean and mean, and I'm sure they're doing stuff that I would love to know about. So, um, you know, we can all learn from each other despite, you know, the size differences in, in the organizations out there. This has been such an insightful conversation. It's been essentially a masterclass. And I think, and what Hot Docs has done is just so much for me to digest. 
I'm going to have to watch this interview over and over again just to figure it all I'm out. I'm going to have to take a week off to digest because literally it's been, you know, every single person that works at Hot Docs, like I have to give a shout out to our communications team. They're the ones who have had to communicate all of this stuff to audiences and convince them that they should stick with Hot Docs and like try watching a film on our website. Um, and they've done a fantastic job, but like literally every single person that works with us uh, is the reason why we've been able to pull this off. So. We have an incredible team. Jen, thank you so much for joining me and for taking the time to spread your knowledge and experience. Thank you and good luck to everybody. Hopefully we'll be able to see each other inside of a, an arts building someday in 2020. <laughs> if you enjoyed this series and found value in it, make sure to subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook. That's where we announce when new content is available. We're also constantly publishing new webinars on our blog. And if you want to attend those webinars live, Join our mailing list to find out when tickets are available. The sessions usually fill up before we get a chance to post them on social.